internet friends. Welcome to another episode of the Synergy Cafe online show featuring speaker, entertainer, close-up illusionist, and marketing alchemist, Magic Brad. It's the internet lifestyle show about career, finance, relationships, spirituality, and wellness. We're moving the online chatter over to real life activity. And now, please welcome your host of Synergy Cafe, Magic Brad. Oh, hey, Internet friends, this is Magic Brad with Synergy Cafe and the Synergy Collaborative, and I've got a well-known Internet name online today, and his name is Perry. How you doing, Perry? Great. Uh, my name is Perry Marshall, and it's great to be on this program today. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I do these kind of quick. It'll only be like about 10 minutes or so just to get to know who you are. For the people that don't know you, I've been online, so I've seen your name around here and there and everywhere. So um, are you? where are you located? I'm in Chicago. Oh, you're in, also in the Midwest here. Okay, so you're neighbors. I'm in Minneapolis, Minnesota. You're in. Are you right in the city? I'm really close. Okay. So you're Oak Park. <laughs> yeah, I uh, moved uh, down to Asheville, North Carolina, for a couple of years, and everybody said, "Don't drive through Chicago with that big trailer," and I did. <laughs> I did. <laughs> I'm sure it was a lot of fun, especially at five o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> yes. So, are you married? Do you have kids? Yeah, I've got married, got six kids, two of them adopted from China, uh, age six through 20. So um, life is never boring around here. Plus, <laughs> we homeschool and I work at home, so it's always commotion all the time. Well, that's the the movement. Everybody's starting to either work from home or work from one of these foam thingies where you don't really have to have that nine to five anymore. It's kind of fascinating. That's to, right. I think you and I are in sort of the same industry here of internet marketing and things of that sort. Yes. You want to share a little bit about that, what you got yeah. going on? So I, I'm very well known. I uh, I wrote the book Ultimate Guide to Google AdWords, which is the world's best selling book on internet advertising. And, and also my book, 8020 Sales and Marketing, is a, a bit of a classic. And, uh, and, th and then the reason that you wanted this interview today was uh, to discuss my book evolution 2.0 which um you know just yesterday i was in a podcast and and we were talking about 80 20 and he's like no you wrote an evolution book too and uh, yes and it's a science book and uh now the, the book does uh actually include some online content that goes over to the business side as well and i have found evolutionary stuff to be exquisitely useful in business um but it's really a science book it's about the classic question like okay so where did it all come from and how how does life work and you know did, did god beam us onto the savannah you know and and we suddenly appeared there or was there some kind of a natural process what about darwin what about these arguments about intelligent design and 12 years ago I, I got sucked into this and I decided, you know what, I'm, I'm going to get to the bottom of this. I'm going to actually find out. And uh, it ended up being the most fascinating thing I've ever taken a look at. So well, here, here we are. We're, we're sort of in the same boat, if you will, because I like to use nature analogies. And, you know, people have been doing business for a long, long time and nobody's really figured it out yet. Just like you've yes. not figured out the weather yet. You don't know when it's going to happen, but there are right. elements that are laws and you can implement them into business if you do. I use the plant the seed, nurture the plant, harvest the fruit, and the nurturing the plant is the relationship, which takes all the time that so many internet marketers don't use. They just plant the seed and buy my stuff, you know? So right. so can you share more about this this book? You said it's more of a science approach, but of course could be implemented into business. Well, yes, and, and so I, I really wanted to get to the bottom of this, and um, and so I, I went down the rabbit hole. And excuse me, let me clear your throat. <laughs> we can edit this out later, right? <laughs> no, uh, we're authentic and genuine and transparent. Get, just getting over <laughs> a, a bug. Um, so, uh, I, in, in two thousand two, I wrote an ethernet book because I worked in the industrial networking space and um, I didn't, I couldn't have even imagined that fast forward a few years and I get interested in evolution 
that everything that I put in that Ethernet book was going to su suddenly come back around in a new context. Because what I discovered was that DNA, genetic code, and, and the process that cells use when they read DNA and, and translate it into proteins is identical mathematically. <laughs> the, the, the process of reading D DNA and turning it into proteins is mathematically identical to you press send, you send me an email, and my computer reads the email and puts it on the screen. Wow. Um, all of the same steps are involved um, and all the same principles are invoked. It's a digital communications process. Mm -hmm. When I realized that, suddenly I realized that evolution is a software engineering problem. Okay, it's, yeah. it's how, how do I get this code to turn into better code. And, um, and I asked myself the questions like, so do the biologists know something the engineers don't? Or do the engineers know something the biologists don't? Because when I was in engineering school, no, nowhere ever in five and a half years of electrical engineering, did they ever have the class where they say, well, you need a little random mutation and natural selection and survival of the fittest is going to make your software or your, you know, whatever it is, better and better and better. It, it, it never even came up. And my, my engineering intuition was to be very skeptical of evolution. But I, but I started going down the rabbit hole and I kept digging and I kept digging. I mean, I could have come to a conclusion in about six months and been really happy with it, but, and it would have been a kind of a creationist kind of a conclusion. Okay. Mm -hmm. But I knew that there was some data that didn't quite that fit that paradigm. And I kept looking and I kept digging and I kept, it, it actually took me about two or three years, but I eventually found a whole gold, like gold mine of research um, that, uh, that indicates that cells re-engineer themselves. Mm -hmm. And actually everybody sort of knows this. Um, they just don't know they know this, and it's it it comes in in the form of antibiotics, and and the crisis that a, a lot of people know that we have with antibiotics, where the antibiotics are slowly not working anymore. Well, the the reason they're not working anymore, and the reason that you have to finish your antibiotic before you know, and and like the whole bottle, right? The doctor says you you have to finish this whole entire bottle, right? Is, is because the bacteria, if you give them half of a chance, they will re-engineer themselves and they will become resistant. And, and if you don't hear anything else I say today, hear this. This does not happen by accident. It doesn't happen by chance. It's not that a few of them just kind of have, to have a lucky mutation. What what germs do when they're fighting antibiotics is pretty much the same way entrepreneurs fight a business crisis. They yeah. massively rearrange and uh, re-engineer themselves, just like we do. In fact, if you've been in business evolution for a few years, you actually understand biological evolution better than you think you do. Mm -hmm. So, you know, are cells conscious? I don't know. I, I can't answer questions like that. But I can tell you that a bacteria can do more software engineering in 12 minutes than a team of engineers can do in 12 weeks. And there is so much that we can learn from nature. It's unbelievable. Well, you got my attention here more than I had anticipated. Could you hold your book up again? Because I think I want to yeah. get your book. <laughs> yeah, it's called Evolution 2.0. Breaking the deadlock between Darwin and design, and 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 the, the the way that you break the deadlock is to understand is that living things design themselves. They redesign themselves. Yeah. I mean, this is trippy. It's it's almost M. C. Escher like, where the stairways Ex are exactly, going up, but then they're going down. Okay, I'm serious. This so is so amazing. And so you have this debate. You have the creationists that are like. It's designed and there's all these nano machines and there's all this digital information and that's 
a, a result of intelligence. So creationism is true. And then you have the evolutionists and they're like, hey, you know, we there, there's this progression from the simple to the complex and it's in the fossil record. And no, it's not a divine miracle. It's this natural process. <laughs> well, they're both, first of all, yeah. they're both ignoring they're both right about certain things. Mm -hmm. And for the most part, both sides are ignoring the parts that the other side has gotten right. I mean, right. it's just like politics or anywhere <laughs> where, I mean, hopefully any mature person recognizes that when you have two sides, they both, they almost always both have legitimate things to say. I mean, sure. I've hardly ever seen a big debate out there where one side was just completely insane Right. And the other side was completely right. Well, so they're both ignoring each other, but 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 they're they're overlooking empirical experimental evolution, because the experimental part is that you can get a new species in days. It doesn't take millions of years. All right. it takes is to hybridize two species together. I mean, there, there's a whole there's a whole fascinating strand of, of research and it speaks to everything that humans do. I mean, this is not just some high in the sky, airy fairy thing. This affects everybody. Well, the thing you just got done saying about the two different polarities, isn't that kind of like the wave particle thing? It depends on what you're observing and that's essentially what yes. it is. And I was gonna also yes. ask you, could you just, uh, this is just something that popped in, but the whole flower of life and the seed of life kind of thing with the circles and the seven and all that, is that relevant to this? Well, so, so life is fractal. Uh, you know, fractal being patterns within patterns within patterns yeah. and the micro pattern and the macro macro pattern are both the same. In fact, um, in, in fact, could you hang on a sec? Sure. That's all good. So this is very fascinating stuff. I don't know if you're listening and paying attention, but you should be taking some notes on this. So this is very interesting <laughs> stuff. Thank you. Well, well so, so, so I, I'd like to give you like two, two interesting perspectives is, is first of all, a single cell is more complicated than New York City and has fabulously orchestrated processes. I mean, if you could shrink yourself down and be inside of a cell, which I'd, I'd like, I'd give anything to do that. <laughs> I mean, my goodness, I, I really wish I could, but you would see this, this fantastic level of organization. Um, well, if you zoom out, if you look at the whole entire Earth, the whole entire Earth does, in a sense, function as a single organism. Yeah. So life on Earth has transformed the atmosphere from being um, like a lot. Our neighboring planets are <clears throat> lots and lots of carbon dioxide and, and, and poisonous gases and very little oxygen and very little nitrogen. But Earth has transformed itself. It didn't used to be like this, but now it's mostly nitrogen and a lot of oxygen and very little carbon dioxide. Life on Earth did that. Life on Earth holds the Earth at a state far from equilibrium, far from what just astronomy and physics would dictate. Earth regulates its temperature, it regulates its pressure, the way your body regulates its own temperature. And so, so you can look at life as organisms within organisms within organisms and layers and layers. And, you know, there really is a beautiful harmony to it all. And, um, you know, and I, I think these, these warring sides, both of them ignore the, the profound intelligence that's embedded in all of it. Well, you just got my, you just, you just shifted my whole plan for today. Because <laughs> this is some this is some of the stuff that I've been thinking about for a while now. I mean, when I was a little kid, I I thought of the solar system, and it's very similar to the atoms and the molecules orbiting and all that kind of stuff. So the microcosm equals the macrocosm, all that kind of stuff. Uh -huh. So now um, I've been right now I was putting together a program about time, and I don't know if you're familiar with fractal time that uh, Greg Braden mm -hmm. that book, but uh, the concept of time is universal. The the idea of 24 hours in a day and all that and people seem to not have enough of it but everybody's got the same amount it's, so i was working yes. on some stuff like that but now you just shifted my thinking into some other bizarre stuff so i think one of the things i'm going to do is go get your book <laughs> i don't like to read but i i, 
I love this concept. Well, it's also an audible. So you can, okay. you know, it's cool. a Kindle and it's in hardcover in any way that you want. But, you know, what, one of the things I found is, you know, my, vast majority of my audience is, is a business audience. And I have lots of my business customers reading this book and they get the book. And here's why. If you're an entrepreneur or for that matter, if you're a blogger or if you're a podcaster or if you, you know, if, if you do your life on the Internet, you have a gun to your head every day. It's like you have to innovate. You have to come up with something new. You have to come up with something interesting. And if you don't, you're dead. Yeah. Right. And, oh and, and that's our life. Like we, we constantly have to come up with better and better. It has to get faster. It has to get simpler. It has to get more elegant. It, we, we have to get more traffic. We have to get it for less money. We have to convert the traffic to dollars more effectively than we did last week. And you know what? That is life on earth. That's what every cell has to do. That's what every living sure. thing has to do. And so Creative people have always been skeptical of this idea that all you need is billiard balls banging around in the universe and in survival of the <laughs> fittest is just going to sort it all out. And it's all just going to pop out. You know, there's, 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 there's billions of people that are like, uh, I, I, I'm not sure I can like get into a debate with a scientist about this. I would probably lose, but this just does, does not compute. And, and you know what? This book will help you understand it's not just billiard balls banging around in the universe. There's, there's intelligence all the way down to the single cell. And it is magnificently choreographed and coordinated to a level that human technologies can't even dream of. Right. And, 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 and early on, in, at the beginning of the search, I said, okay, they did not teach me Darwinian evolution in electrical engineering. Why not? Did, 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 you know, who knows something that I don't know? What's up? Go and I realized, you know what, if the, if the traditional old school Darwinists were right, Bill Gates wouldn't need employees. All we would do, we we get like 10 million computer servers. We would just pour junk into them and like turn the crank and, and software would come out the other side. Because look, that's essentially what the Darwinists are trying to tell you that, that life is doing. It's like, no, 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 no. What if instead of having 10,000 software engineers in Redmond, Washington, what if every copy of Windows was its, was its own programmer? Sure. It's kind of like uh, Mark Zuckerberg's got everybody posting and sharing and it's growing exponentially. Right. Yeah. Right. So what if, what if the software itself was smart? Right. All the intelligence of the Internet is from the humans. Right. They're all putting it in and it gets smarter and smarter all the time. But it, it's from all those fingers on keyboards yeah. and it's from all the series that are hearing voices and figuring <laughs> out if they got it right or not. Right. But what if the intelligence was intrinsic? What if it was innate? And see, I, I maintain that we still don't really even understand 95 percent of it. We only understand about 5% of what's going on with evolution and that this is a huge, huge, huge avenue of discovery. Both of the traditional sides of the debate have been completely ignoring something that's right in front of our face. And we need to understand this and not, not just for like positive, happy technological reasons, but also for the purpose of, of having a real respect for nature. Nature is smarter than us. We need to learn from nature. If we think we're going to reprogram nature or fix nature, we're in trouble. That's a very dangerous view. Um, and, and so we need to be humble before nature and before God and, and, and really study what's in front of us. Yeah, well, my wife is a shaman, and they deal with spirituality on the nature plane. And I've seen some bizarre stuff, but you can't, you can't explain all that stuff. And like I said, I, a lot of what I do, how I base my business is on nature, the plant, the seed, nurture the plant, harvest the fruit kind of thing. But I don't want to take too much time. Uh, I like people to be able to grab this and then run to the bookstore and get it. So could you hold your book up there again one more yeah. time? And then, uh, then I want to yeah, ask my... Evolution 2.0, Breaking the Deadlock Between Darwin and Design. And you can go to CosmicFingerprints.com and get three free chapters. It's on Kindle. It's hardcover. It's audible. You can get it on Amazon. You can get it from uh, Barnes & Noble. So 
I, I, I think this will take you on a really fascinating journey. I think so. and it, it'll get you, you will see the world in a way that you never saw it before. You will ask yourself questions that you never asked yourself before. And I think it, it will really stimulate your imagination. Well, before I let you go, I want to ask my favorite question. That's the big why question. Why are you doing this? Why aren't you like a grade school teacher or why aren't you teaching Cub Scouts or why aren't you a surf instructor or something? Why are you doing what you're doing? What's the big well, why? You know, the, the evolution project, I could make a lot more money doing my business stuff, which I still do. Um, but I, I had to do this. This is the biggest untold story in the history of science. And Frankly, I mean, the whole project was a giant pain in the ass, but I, I, I mean, it was very hard, but I have the privilege of telling the story and I'm going to tell it because it has to be told and people need to hear it. Very good. I'm very interested. I'm going to share this with my network of folks. So Perry, I'm honored to uh, interview you and thank you much for taking the time on Synergy Cafe. Thank you very much. Thank you.